Not every element that we use on NASA's James Webb Space Telescope is unique to the mission. Sometimes we use things that are tried and true and very abundant. We don't find silicon like this on Earth. It's pure form. It's usually paired with oxygen in the form of a silicate. And silicates make up 90% of the Earth's crust. Between 2010 and 2018, people purified 7.37 million metric tons of silicon. 2018's global revenue was $11.4 billion. What makes this element so special that the epicenter of the tech world is named after it? Let's head over to the shop and see why silicon works so well for this mission. So yeah, silicon is cheap and available. But the reason we want to use it is because it happens to be a semiconductor. Now, a semiconductor is something doesn't conduct very well, like this metal object, or insulate things, like wood would do. We want it to be able to do both with a little coaxing of electricity. A photodetector looks a lot like this, and it's on a silicon wafer and we use it because it has a stable atomic structure. When light passes on this, the silicon lets out a few electrons. That is the electrical voltage, which then translates into data for the scientists. Silicon isn't the only semiconductor or even the best semiconductor, but its ability to switch between giving an electrical signal or not, meaning a one or a zero, makes it worth it. Well, hello everybody. This is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance. And we are uh, with uh, yet another edition of First Light Chronicles. Uh, today with us, we have uh, Annie and, uh, and Kent, of course. And uh, uh, so before we go to Kent and start talking about how to control light pollution, um, let's touch base with Annie and the Explore Alliance. Hey, everybody. I just kind of made a joke on the stream that I was crashing the party because uh, Scott mentioned that I was on here today. So um, it's been a little it, it's been a little busy around here, which is a good thing. So um, getting to know our new customers that have new product and helping the helping our um, our uh, seasoned customers um, with their new new items or whatever they're needing assistant will, assistance with. Um, but today I wanted to just kind of highlight uh, membership and um, and what astrophotography contest we have going on. Um, Tyler and I have um, kind of been a little bit lackadaisical on kind of reminding everybody that we do have an astrophotography contest going on. And so I apologize for that. But um, we, uh, let me show my screen here. So uh, we currently have a meteor, um, um, contest going on, um, and you have to be a member in order to submit a, 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 an image. So um, I'm going to show you how to do that first. And it doesn't matter if you're legacy, it doesn't matter if you're platinum, just, just some sort of membership. And then, you know, if you, if you submit one and they go, oh, I forgot, you know, just let us know and we can help you remedy that yeah. that issue and the, and, so and the difference between legacy and platinum is what annie so the difference between the legacy and platinum is um the benefits that you get and one is a prepaid level and one is not so um let's go to that so explore alliance and then you're going to go over to memberships and so we're going to scroll down it's going to hopefully Ah, it loaded, it loaded after I went to the bottom. Sorry about that. Okay, so the legacy membership, you know, you're able to uh, um, uh, enter contests and prizes and you get sneak peeks of new products. And of course, uh, VIP access to some of our events and things like that. Um, 
you know, it, everything's complimentary on there. There's no dues or fees or anything with that. So um, it's just a, just a great way to keep up to date with everything and be able to also enter drawings and prizes and, and see what, see what we're doing. Um, Explore Alliance, uh, the Explore Alliance Platinum membership is a paid, it comes with an extended care, no fault coverage. Um, it's, uh, it um, costs $99, $99, 99 cents a year, but we turn around and give you a gift card back um, for that. So every time you renew, you would get a, you'll get a gift card. Um, you get uh, purchases and discounts of new products. You get, you know, this, those same uh, sneaks and peaks of those products, you know, so, but you'll get the first dibs at those um, to be able to, um, to be able to purchase them. Um, and then of course, um, con you get your contests and prizes as well. Um, and then free maintenance on any of your Explore Alliance um, or Explore, Explore Scientific products. The thing is, the thing with the, the membership is it goes with the member. It doesn't go with your product. So let's say you buy an ED80 and you decide that you wanna sell it, but you're, an, you're a member the telescope would then go to whoever's purchasing it, but, but your membership would stay with you. So it, it, it's actually for the member and not for whatever product. It's totally different than any type of, it's not, it's not a warranty. It's not a, it's not anything like that. So it's just, it's just a benefit to, to our members. Um, so, um, but the great thing about it is, is we get to see, a benefit for us is we get to see all y'all's amazing images that you do because we um, in turn make have contests and things like that. So um, I'm gonna show you. So this is one, this is our Gal Galaxy Astrophotography Contest that we that we had. It, this is, this was not, I don't think this was our first contest. Was it Kent? Was the Galaxy one the first or was it the, the big one? I don't remember. So I think we kicked remember. off. I think we. I think we kicked off all of our our first ever uh, astrophotography contest, which was this one, which was a really big. Um, it had tons of categories in it and and things like that. So, um, and we usually we usually pick three winners is what we've done in the past, but we changed it to four because we want. We, we have a lot of seasoned um, astrophotographers that, that submit, but we also want to see those new and upcoming um, astrophotographers. We, we want to see what you're doing. And so um, we've added a new category um, called never before seen. I think we've called it a couple of different things. Just, we just, you know, we just want to see what's going on with our, our members and how well they're doing. And so um, the new contest is the Meteor Astrophotography Contest. Um, first place winner receives a hundred dollar Explore Science gift card and upgrade to their EA membership if applicable. Appl I cannot talk. Appl appl applicable. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've only had three sips of coffee today. Just saying. Okay, um, and so that means that if you're already at platinum, I, unfortunately, I can't upgrade you higher because that's the highest, <laughs> that's highest, the highest it goes, it goes. Two levels. <laughs> <laughs> so it's only two levels um but if you're legacy then we'll upgrade that to a legacy to a platinum membership uh, uh free for a year so um and then the, uh, you'll get an 18 by 24 uh, uh print of your mount or of your image um then the second place is 75 dollar gift card same thing uh upgraded membership and a print third place is 50 dollars um uh, upgraded membership and a print. Um, the never before seen award is it's, um, or first time uh, entrant, which means you've never entered before um, a contest. Um, the winner receives a, an upgraded membership and an 18 by 24 mounted print as well. So all these member, all these winners go into our Skies Up magazine. On top of them, any of our entries even if you didn't place in one of these in one of these places, then you're you go up into we you get published in our Skies Up magazine as well. So um, I highly, highly, highly encourage you to submit, 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 submit. So um, I, you only get to uh, do two pictures um, per person, and I think it's really easy. You just click here. Oh, hang on. That's that that's for membership. Hang on. If you aren't a member, click there <laughs> and then click here to enter. 
and then you can enter all of your all of your information and upload your pictures and things like that. So um, Tyler and I have a lot of fun when these come in. We sit down and look at them and um, it's a lot of fun to review them. And um, and we get really excited to see to see everybody's um, work. So so I highly recommend that you join Explore Alliance and submit some images to our meteor contest. <laughs> Scott's been laughing at me all week because he's like, Annie, smile. <laughs> smile, Annie, smile. That's right. Uh, it's always so there's a new movie that Annie and I have been talking about called Don't Look Up. It's on Netflix. If you guys haven't watched it yet, um, uh, you're going to uh, you're going to want to watch it. Uh, it's hilarious. Um, I gave it some good marks for accuracy that the stage is set by two astronomers discovering a comet. And if you've already watched it, OK, don't be a spoiler in chat, but um, uh, it is, uh, it's funny. I've already watched it once. I'm going to watch it again. So um, dark humor though. So just a little warning. Um, so, um, so I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, Jim's Astro is asking if you get a member certificate, if you're just a legacy member and yes, you do 100% get a, get a certificate, no matter your level of, uh, of uh, membership, you get a certificate. So if you haven't seen your certificate, please let me know and I will dig into it and figure it out for you. Okay. All right, Andy, thank you very much. And uh, uh, you, if you guys don't know this, Andy is also often on our Amazon live um, broadcasts and stuff. So I'll try to uh, uh, give you guys a link to where you can see the Amazon live information here in chat. But um, she's doing a good job. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm All definitely right. going to ring in the new year with that movie, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, All right. Let me know I, what you think of it. I will. Okay. All right. So, um, so let's, uh, let's switch over to Kent. Kent, uh, uh, you're, you're going to uh, cover an article that's in the latest that's issue. Right. That's right. That's right. So let me share my screen here. So we're going to be talking about what's going on in Quebec, the province of Quebec in Canada. And um, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about, you know, from what the portion of Canada you see on this map. So from the Great Lakes down here to Toronto and up here through Maine, the portion of Canada you see on this map represents half the population of the country. Uh, and I looked up 90% of Canadians live within 100 miles of the U.S. border. So, um, you know, this is an, it's an interesting statistic. So zoom out a little bit for those of you. Here's Quebec. And we're going to be talking about a specific park that got this started in Quebec. Oops. And it's the uh, Magnetic Mountain or Mont Magnetique. Uh, and if you get on the peak, it's a class two, Bortle class two, has an SQM meter of 21.9. So it's decently dark, it's pretty nice. Uh, but you've got the bubble, this is uh, 50 kilometers, so it's, 50, 100, 150, 200 kilometers to Montreal. So, you know, a good distance away. It's still going to be a, a glow on the horizon, but it's a good distance away. So in the Skies Up Global Ma Magazine, we, we have an article by uh, Mihai R. Pinchingina. Sorry, can't speak French real well. Who is the president of the IDA Quebec uh, chapter. Uh, so this talks about the um, dark sky movement uh, that, that was created, uh, that created the International Dark Sky Preserve at Mont Magnetic, uh, the first of its kind in the world. Uh, they started working on it in 2002. Um, and 
everybody has been aware of light pollution for years and years and years, uh, but they realize that the the efforts to uh, the mild, little efforts have been going on in the '90s to uh, keep Mont Magnetique open uh, was doomed because of light pollution. Uh, so the the entire region uh, in Quebec ended up adopting what became known as uh, the QN BNQ 4913-100 standard. The article really goes into uh, how they uh, started uh, working on it and, and how they uh, um, were able to quantify and propose solutions. They came up with a four-tiered uh, zone system uh, that uh, dealt with big cities versus small cities. Uh, there's only there's ten Quebec cities that have more than 100,000 inhabitants. Uh, so anything under 100,000 was considered small, and everything above 100,000 was considered large. They came up with Zen, which is uh, French, and all these the BNQ is a French uh, acronym from French, Zones d'éclairage nocturne. Um, how'd my French sound? I hope it sounded pretty good. <laughs> you French speakers out there, tell me, give us feedback in chat whether you, it sounded pretty good or not. Um, so they felt like the bigger cities had more resources. So Zen areas zero to two are areas with few inhabitants, Zen 3 is reserved for cities with more than 100,000. Uh, Zen 0 effectively is a conservation area or a protected dark sky area. And uh, Zen 4 is urban areas. So they felt like you know treating all areas the same would be a flawed approach. So they came up with this Zen system. And through it, they were able to determine you know, what they could protect and how to go about it. And the whole philosophy was what I've said before, the minor, the light, the correct amount of light at the right time, in the right location, for the right time, and not shining up. Those are the principles they attack this. So, uh, whoops, sorry about that. So they came up with the BNQ uh, 4930-100 standard, uh, they, it recommends and requires uh, zone limits uh, that controls the duration of the use of lighting systems uh, in common with other uh, situations, uh, specifically time of day, which think about as curfew hours, uh, when light should be tim dimmed or turned off. Uh, controlling the direction of light, uh, which you know is no more no light going above ninety degrees above the horizontal. Uh, and regulating the quantity of light. And this is where a lot of, I, I think a lot of resistance comes in in enforcing dark sky regulations is that if you can't measure it, governments don't really want to enforce it. So it can, comes up with some standards for uh, measuring lighting as well as exemptions for uh, in, the maximum intensity is what they call hot spots. Uh, so that was uh, considered. So they came up with best practices called MP for Meliorius Practiques, uh, which are values showing the way forward to improve, and then compromise, uh, technical compromise in terms of what's on the market inventory, energy performance, et cetera. Uh, they also talk about the limiting color. I thought that this was interesting. Uh, and they talked about as well as quantity, direction, color, and duration uh, has been organized into 17 applications um, into their Zen tables. I find found their colorations uh, valuations interesting. They're very aggressive with the color or temperature of the light. Um, in parking areas, they want they they look at 
1800 Kelvin, which is a really sort of yellow light, uh, while the technical compromise is 22 to 3000 K. Uh, lighting below canopies and lighting for illuminations, uh, illuminated signs is 2700 K, uh, with 3000 to 4000 as, as you know, compromise numbers. 4000 is getting into that blue light area that is very harsh and very, uh, very, very bright. Um, so uh, in Zen areas, uh, many Zen areas, uh, I believe it was zero through three, two, there are no outdoor light permitted. Uh, and where there are outdoor lights, they can't have a white background. White backgrounds are, are prohibited. The background must be darker than the text and symbols uh, so that you don't have a bright white background that has a little bit of text, a little bit of symbol. So you create this gigantic light that's showing up. It also requires uh, that 30 minutes after closing time, exterior lights must be turned off. Uh, in the case of nonstop situations, a reduction of 75% is required after 10 p.m. in most areas. Uh, in case where signs are permitted, they follow the same turned down rules. Um, as it concludes here, the BNQ provides a powerful tool for all those concerned by the loss of, of the night. Uh, IDA is now preparing training sessions in French on the use of the standard, and they plan on having live things. So, you know, there's some technical information in there, but I think that it gives a pretty good idea of uh, a way to go about quantifying and uh, widespread adoption. Uh, you know, this became a provincial adoption, uh, not just like a municipality, because you can go back to this light pollution map and see that, you know, the light pollution from Montreal spills over into Vermont. The light pollution from Quebec spills over into, uh, you know, on the province of Ontario. So, you know, it's a regional issue. It's not a local issue. Uh, even if Quebec City turned off all of their lights or went to 100% full cop shields tomorrow, and there'd still be massive light pollution from Montreal nearby and from Ottawa. So, um, you know, I really really think that light pollution is going to get attacked effectively at least on a statewide scale if not on a national scale you know there's national building codes in the united states there's plumbing codes there's fire codes there's all sorts of of codes that nobody complains about they live by them uh, but uh, there's no lighting code and so it's not about taking away light it's about the right amount for the right duration and the right temperature et cetera, et cetera. So gone through the article. There's a whole bunch of other articles in here. We're going to go through a couple other articles from other editions that we haven't done. I think this is a worthwhile exercise. Uh, so to reef back here, right there is where this park is. So that's going to be what, 20, 40 kilometers away from uh, Sherbrooke. And so, you know, decently dark skies. Uh, you get up here in the north woods of Maine, that's dark right there. That's going to be border one. Yeah. You know, SQM meter of 20, you can't get any darker than that. Or excuse me, 22, you can't get any darker than that. So, you know, there's pretty good dark skies, you know, uh, decently dark skies. Um, so in the neck of the woods. But, you know, what's amazing is you start looking at northern Canada and how much it's dark, but it's shocking how much light pollution there is. You know, and then you get up here on the north slope of Alaska, where you've got, you know, tons of drilling and Fairbanks there and Anchorage down there. So anyway, uh, you know, one group of people created a provincial response uh, through some concerted effort and good thinking. So Scott, any questions, any chatter going on? Well, let's let's look at who's on line with us. Uh, 
we've got uh, Mike Wiesner was the first to uh, log in. He's um, uh, saying hello from rainy Arizona. It was rainy here today too, Mike. Um, and Harold Locke says it's rainy in San Diego. <laughs> it was rainy Huz- here this morning. Sun came out. Now it looks like, yeah, the sun's coming Hazari out. Hazari Ha says hello, Scott Roberts. Hello back. Uh, Joseph uh, uh, Tre- I-, I might mess this up, Joseph. Trero Tola, Trero Tola. Okay, he says, hey, now. That's great, man. Chris Larson is on. Uh, we got Josh Kovac on. Um, Jim Astro logged on. Uh, actually, a very nice group of people watching today. Um, uh, um, I think a lot of people were interested to learn about this uh, BNQ um, 4930-100 standard. Uh, I did not know that there was such a standard that existed like that. Uh, do you, d- does the article point out how much impact it's had upon uh, uh, the community or a surrounding area? It, it said at one point earlier, I think it's, I, I think it was before the adoption, the, the adoption of, the, of it, the efforts mm-hmm. they'd gone through had been uh, uh, attributed to, I believe it was 200,000 Canadian a year, like in the mid 2000s, the, the sub 2010s. So, you know, you can, the, the, the problem with LEDs is you can create a lot more light for a lot cheaper. And human nature is not, I mean, the whole hope was that LEDs, because they were so controllable, would cause, you know, light pollution to go down. I can remember the, the excitement, you know, in the, in the astronomy community about how light pollution, the LEDs are going to help light pollution. Yeah. And it has done exactly the opposite. It has well, accelerated they probably, it, it. Changing the technology, they did not adjust the uh, budgets, okay, saying, okay, exactly. we're going to save this much more money. Therefore, we're going to take away this budget from you, okay, and use it towards something else, like, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, some other program that uh, would help the community. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, a lot of budgets are use or lose, you know, so... Right. Right. So if you've yep. got if you got the budget and it's use or lose, well, we're going to buy more lights. Right. Or we're going to we're going to more do light. Something. More light is always better. That's the thought. Right. If if a little light's good, let's light up the whole street. I mean, I drive down streets at night. that are lit up. And it's like there's it's, it's midnight. Why is this street lit up like it is Yeah, lit you know? up like a Christmas tree? Yeah. yeah there's no, I mean, I, I fully drive safely. Um, in the dark, in rural areas here in Northwest Arkansas, with no trouble, my we my vehicles do. my vehicles have headlights on them. Now I can see putting putting up st- adequate street lights at intersections and difficult to see turns. Right, get a little bit more light. Yeah, if you have some side traffic coming or yeah. something like that, but just going down a boulevard, you know, I'm, just I'm really curious about this, Kent. Maybe you know the answer to it, but you know, we have a lot of wildlife here in Arkansas and. You have a lot of deer, and unfortunately, you find, uh, you know, when when there's, uh, you know, when it's deer season or whatever, uh, we find a lot of deer impacts, you know, on the side of the road and stuff like that. How do how do uh, lights affect those animals? I don't think lights affect those animals at all. You know, that deer can are very all wildlife in that. I think mammal wildlife is very adaptable very flexible like we were talking about house sparrows the last on the wing you know house sparrows are a wild bird but they're intrinsically tied to humans Uh, you know coyotes have thrived as an urban animal you know they were a completely wild animal but in the last 50 to 100 years they have become a very urbanized animal that can function well around humans and so um you know i don't think that the light has the same effect on deer as um, you might think it would be harmful. In fact, uh, my home in in downtown Bentonville, I would often see deer feeding in my yard directly under a streetlight. And so they, they just didn't care. I mean, there was, there was no threat to them. There's, there was no hunting. And so they had no real predators other than uh, vehicles. Right. Mm -hmm. So, they could they fed under i'd come home 
after dark and they'd be standing there in the yard grazing away happy as you know campers and they'd look at me like hey home from work are you you know didn't care so i don't think it affects deer so much and and people um you know i think the thought is well if we have more lights i can see the deer on the side of the road yes you can and they're, they're either going to still run in front of you or not and unless you're going to slow way way down every time you see a deer on the side of the road lit up by a street light and i, I don't think people are going to do that because you do it 50 or 100 times the, the deer don't run out in front of you and you eventually go well heck i'm just going to keep going the speed limit it's that 101 and, time yeah and then a deer runs out in front of you and hit it well you know, I mean, it's just going to happen or it's not. I, I think sort of a fatalistic view of things like that. And I have, re, you know, a couple of years ago, I had a deer. I was driving along by our farm, coming down a hill on a paved road, on a county road. And I see this deer jump over the fence. I'm like going, and it just ran headlong into the side of my truck, three big old dents down the side of it. And of course, mm. you know, I stopped and it got up and went, and took off, you know, it didn't just, didn't even knock it loopy. So Richard Grace says, I stopped hitting the brakes for deer and started hitting the gas. At least they run from wide open throttle Trans Am. <laughs> you know, um, maybe <laughs> I don't know. I remember reading somewhere that, that uh, this suggestion that if you're literally going to run into a deer, you shouldn't apply the brakes because that makes the front end of your vehicle go down, which increases the chance that it comes up on the hood and comes into the compartment with you. I think it said the thing about, it, I think it was more aimed at moose because, you know, moose are taller and longer legged, but just when you slam on the brakes, the front of your car goes down. And so you're better off just to hit them. You know, Chris Larson says he just totaled his Jeep by hitting a deer. Yeah. It's no fun. <laughs> no. Mm -mm. no it's, fun. It's, uh... It's a little bit tough. I don't know, you know, uh, if, if street lights help or hurt in this situation. So, um, but uh, yeah, I've driven a lot to a lot of dark sky sites and I love driving, uh, you know, through, through the dark, uh, but I do slow way down. I, I don't go fast in the, in the dark, you know, I slow down. I think the older we get, the more caught the, the you know, our eyes don't work as well as they used to. I mean, I'm, I'm noticing that, uh, mm -hmm. that my eyes don't adjust as fast as they used to. So it's somewhat age related as well. And, you know, you get to the point that you, it's hard to drive at night. And so you, you know, you change your lifestyle and you don't do it. You plan ahead and try to try to avoid it. Right. Right. Yeah. So, uh, that's great. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, this article, I think uh, it, it's nice that there is a, um, you know, a standard that's put out there. You can tell there's a lot of work that was put into it, a lot of consideration. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully these kinds of uh, uh, considerations can be applied in other countries. Um, you know, last night we had uh, Dr. Marcello Souza from Brazil, and he was talking about the new dark sky park that is, has been initiated in Brazil. Um, and I, it starts with the letter P. Let me see if I can find it for you guys. Dark, it was on darksky.org. And let's see if I can find it. Brazil. Oh, here it is. Ah. The reason why it starts with the letter P is because uh, it's Park, P A R Q U E, Estado Joao de Do de Sanjano, okay, P E D in Portuguese. Let me give you the page. Um, but this is the first dark sky park in South America. So it's very cool. You know, also, Scott, you know, the, the international. Dark Sky Association, darksky.org, has model lighting ordinances. It's not like, you know, cities and municipalities or governments, state governments would have to, to write every word of it. The model ordinances are out there. 
I mean, it's it's a standard that's available. Uh, that's um, was a collab collaboration between the Interna International Dark Sky Association and the Illuminating Engineering Society. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, P. Edward Murray says, do you guys ever notice the ultra bright headlights driving at night? Uh, I can tell you that my truck has, uh, even with at the dimmest setting, um, has pretty bright lights. And I know that because I'm driving along and I <coughs> notice people are flashing their, their headlights at me like, hey, buddy, turn it down. And then I turn on my, my brights. <laughs> And, and they're pretty much, uh, you know, knocked out of their car. So yeah. uh, I don't know what can be done to, to help that. Um, but uh, it is, it is kind of, it, it's beyond annoying. I, I, I think it's dangerous. See, it's dangerous. Right. But a lot of, a lot of vehicles, including my Ram 2500 uh, has that built into it. So, you know, um, I, there's cars. There's cars that are, there's, that are blindingly bright and vehicles. I don't say cars, vehicles like your truck. And you, you can't see the rest of the road. You know, it's a case of it's great for the driver, but it's horrible for everybody else. Yeah. And I, I, I think there's at some point, I think you'll see some, some reg, federal regulation regarding that because it has to be causing wrecks you know, people running right. off the road. Oh yeah. Uh, I don't think, I don't think it would cause people to hit them, but I think it would cause people. I mean, I just basically try to look at the shoulder of the road and say a little prayer, keep me between the ditches, you know, keep, keep me between the yellow line, and the white line and hope, hope for the best. Yeah. I don't know where to, where to start really about uh, headlights, uh, but the IDA, the next time I talk to the guys at IDA, I'm going to mention this and see what they're, uh, you know, if they have a response on, um, you know, what can be done as far as the car industry, automobile industry and lights. Um, but uh, bright lights are, are, are tough when, when you're driving at night and it can make you tired if you're seeing a bunch of them. So. Yep. So Terex so and Kent, Visit us and help us to battle light pollution. Correct. Yeah. I can't do it. I'm an outsider. Uh, that it starts. Pekka can tell you it starts with one person. You know, Pekka's efforts have have shown some some changes in Stockholm, Sweden, at least yeah. in his neighborhood, in his area of the city. It starts with one person. Um, I can't come to the UAE and, and make it happen. Heck, I can't even make it happen here. Uh, you know, I, I talk to people pretty regularly. I've talked to, you know, state level people. I've talked to state senators. I've talked to, to city councilmen, you know, and, and there, there is an awareness of it, but they, it, it ultimately is not seen when they're talking to have to spend, you know, $78 million to upgrade the sewer treatment plant or, uh, you know, $7 million to rebuild this intersection in town or however much to repave how many miles of streets in town, a lighting ordinance is small potatoes, I guess, until you get one of them, like I did in the city of Bentonville, to, to recognize what was going on and find an interesting solution to it. And since then, some cities up here have adopted uh, some ordinance moving forward but again, the enforcement is, is sketchy at best. There was a, a church in Fayetteville, Arkansas, that put up lights that nowhere came close to meeting the Fayetteville's pretty strict lighting ordinance. And it took a concerted effort by people to complain about it, to force the city, because they didn't want to do it. Well, they've already got to put up. Well, you know, they're really not that bad, you know, stuff like that. And it took a concerted effort from the citizenry to put on enough pressure to force the city to enforce the ordinance. And I think, like Scott has said before, and I mentioned a little while ago, it's because it's not able to be quantified. You know, it's, it's, 
there, if you can't really measure it easily, how do you enforce it? Because, you know, somebody wants to keep those lights strong enough and has enough money, they're going to claim the city is being arbitrary and capricious in its enforcement. Yeah, yeah. It, it falls back on assume. opinion rather than a measurement. So. Correct. Yeah. You know, I think I've, I, I, I've heard a statement before. You know, what can be measured can be worked on. Implying that if you can't measure, you can't really work to improve anything. You know, and that's a very sort of bean counter approach. Yeah. But, but it's the, the reality the matter is, is that light can be measured quite easily, you know, yeah. so, um, you know, and I think that standards like uh, what they have with the Quebec model is, is, uh, is an encouraging uh, step in the right direction. So it's, it's every, every little step is a step forward. You know, it's a little progress. It takes little progress, little successes, you know, if, if you focus on one gigantic home run to win the game, you know, to use a baseball reference, then you're not playing the game. You've got to play every pitch, every time, all game long to win that game. And, you know, you measure success a little bit at a time. And, you know, I would love to be able to engineer a grand slam home run of, you know, national lighting ordinance but that's going to take a whole different infrastructure and and, and and lobbying effort so i'm sort of sadly aware of of the daunting task that is right and uh, before we kind of wrap this up today kent uh we're coming out of christmas now and um there's a lot of people who would have bought like their first telescopes and stuff. How, how is, uh, what, what is the, uh, you know, what, what is the uh, uh, call volume like, or, you know, from a, a customer service side? Are we... I know they're, they're getting a lot of, 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 I haven't talked to them in, in the last day or so, but, you know, on, on Monday, most of the calls were about bigger ticket items. They weren't really? about, um, I can't see anything on my telescope. Yeah, everything's upside down or something. Yeah, you know, you know they, they get a Newtonian telescope and say everything's, everything's sideways and backwards. And it's like, well, that's how that telescope's designed. Or they get a Newtonian telescope and say, I cannot see anything out of it. I've taken off the lens cap. And, I, and, and it's like, well, did you take off the little two-inch one? Yeah, I've taken that off. And, you know, I've turned all those screws and I just can't see anything through it. And I said, well, you haven't taken the lens cap off. And you finally come convince them to hear this boop and that big five inch lens cap comes off of the one fourteen. they go, Oh, oh. and it's like, <laughs> okay. So now you've turned those screws, right? Yeah. Now we got to talk you back through how to recollimate your Newtonian telescope. And it's, <laughs> it's, I see it as a challenge. I, I, I enjoy doing it to help to, to right. talk somebody over the phone, how to recollimate their Newtonian, how to collimate their Newtonian telescope, sure. you know, sure. and, and I take the attitude and I encourage them close enough is good enough. You know, you they'll go online and think they have to have the laser collimator and all this stuff. And it's like, mm. no, 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 no. Close enough is good enough. And uh, I had collimated one of our trust tube dobs in there and then went and got the laser. Yeah. And the laser was on the very edge of the, uh, primary mirrors uh oh, wow. center point so quite a bit off okay well not i mean it was just i mean it was you know that center circle is that big and i was like right here instead of being in the center oh, i see i thought you said oh, you no, were no, no. at the edge of the mirror no okay. that, that center i was at the edge of the center donut okay. by yeah, eyeball that's good enough. sure unless you're doing astrophotography that's way good enough yeah. it's you you know it, it's just people get I, hung I, up I had a that. i had a 13 inch uh, Dobsonian from Coulter. Coulter. Yeah. First got into it. And I didn't even know what collimation was until I had already been using my scope for two years. And I saw all kinds of wonderful things through it, you know? Uh, and then once I learned what the co what collimation was, I realized just how far out of collimation I really, <laughs> I really was. You and know? you couldn't tell it. 
Well, I just, you know, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't looking at smeared stars. I was looking at nebula and galaxies and comets and all of that stuff. So, um, but it was good enough. And once yeah, you let me rose, see what I wanted to see. That's once right. you rose to a level of experience, then that need to be better collimated kicked in. But early on, it's like riding a bicycle. When you first start riding a bicycle, riding 25 miles an hour is not on the radar screen. You're just lucky to keep it up and not run into something. But as you get better, you ride faster. And, and then, you you know, if you, like me, you, you start trying to learn to ride with no hands on the handlebar. And then you tried to pop wheelies and ride wheelies. And then you built a jump ramp in the yard and tried to break your arms. You know, I mean, sure. so it's all the progress. It's just progress. Right. So what you got, Scott, more comments? Well, Tarek is, is uh, talking about the struggles uh, in the UAE about light pollution. Uh, he says he's optimistic, but not in the way as they, uh, not in this way as they plant LEDs everywhere. Uh, so it'll never come soon. Uh, they, they'll change it, uh, come soon to change it or remove it. So if it will happen after years, I'm gone anyway. Exactly right. And Tariq, your my attitude on fighting light pollution is not about finding success for me. It's not about yeah. finding necessarily success for my kids. It's it's literally I I hope my efforts today, right now, and for the rest of my life are about reducing light pollution, not even for my grandkids who are alive now, but for my great grandkids. The this is be born. The, yeah. who yet to be born you know i've got a th four almost 14 year old um six year old four year old and a two year old their kids might benefit in their mid to late adult lives it this has taken 150 years of industrialization to get here and it's yeah. going to take 150 or 200 years maybe to, 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 to move the other way to actually move the needle any significant amount of distance. Right. Um, so it's, it's not about, it's not about me. It's about trying to contribute something that I will never know whether it was successful or not, but it's a worthwhile effort, you know, because it affects more than astronomers. And this is the way you gain Momentum is gain partnerships, mm -hmm. right? You, you, you find people, you know, politics makes strange bedfellows sometimes. Well, ultimately, this is politics. And you're looking at, at nature people who love birds because light pollution causes birds to die. You like people who like insects because light pollution creates light traps that, one, concentrates them in lights for birds that can prey on them. And two, they fly to exhaustion and you can go out under any street light, you know, that's on, on all night long and find how many dead bugs there are. You, you know, there's, it involves all sorts of different people and you get them all working towards an effort that, it, that, that, that addresses their specific concern but it's also your specific concern that might not have anything to do with birds, you know, uh, saving electricity, reducing your carbon footprint. There's all sorts of ways to find people and reasons uh, to do this. You know, municipalities generally are the organizations paying for all those streetlights. And, you know, because they have LEDs, they say, well, look how much more money we're saving. Yes, but you've gone to bright white ones with blue light and you need to address it further. And lots of places are turning off their street lights because they don't want to pay massive sums of money to maintain those street lights. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, um, we encourage all of you to continue to support uh, dark skies uh, in your community and to do what you can do. Um, uh, is sometimes you have to understand that you're, what you're doing now may not show up for 
a while, but pushing, you know, keeping the needle moving in the right direction is really all important. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, today, uh, we have communities, whole communities now that are uh, uh, considered dark sky communities. Uh, some towns take great pride in that. Um, and, uh, you know, the more uh, uh, that uh, the awareness builds on things like that, the more of it there will be. And so, um, and for many, many reasons, uh, dark skies are important, uh, not the least of which is that we can enjoy a beautiful night sky. So, uh, Wait, Scott, you gotta remember, it was just barely a hundred years ago that we found out the universe existed, right? When right. Edwin, and, and Edwin Hubble didn't do all of his research, you know, to about that moment. It was just about expanding knowledge. He wasn't doing it to maybe he was to add to his legacy, but you know, all it takes is one. Sometimes one seed gets planted. You know, for Edwin Hubble, he realized that was I believe it was a Cepheid variable, which was a standard yeah. clock, that's and he right. just worked the math and was astounded. Boy, that's not. There's no way, but there was way. You know. Just one seed, one little thing sometimes has a vast effect on how we perceive whatever it is. For Edwin Hubble, it was a Cepheid variable that calculated out to be outside the Milky Way. And suddenly, right. suddenly we went from the Milky Way being the universe to the Milky Way being part of the universe. And now we know the Milky Way is one tiny, tiny, tiny insignificant spot in the universe and the James Webb space telescope is going to help us find out how tiny and how far away we are in the universe. So it's about progress. It's about setting up change and letting that change happen based on what you do. That's so right. Tariq, you know, I, I beg you don't take that attitude of you can't, you can't fix it in your lifetime. So I'm not going to fix it. Take up the, the mantle. Start talking to people about it. Um, one person can make a difference. And, you know, if you don't try, then it won't be you. So <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Um, but, you know, as some, Tarek is someone uh, that uh, loves astronomy the way that you do. You know, you're, you're a, you would be a great spokesperson for uh, protecting dark skies, you know. And, and uh, you know, uh, it may be that you inspire somebody else. You just never know where conversations like that might go. So anyhow, good luck to all of you guys uh, in your, your fight for dark skies. And um, uh, we'll be back tomorrow uh, with uh, On the Wing with uh, Kent Martz. So Kent's been very busy uh, with uh, uh, keeping up with uh, Christmas, uh, with our dealers. Um, and uh, he's been doing a lot of Amazon Live programs and, uh, of course, these programs that he does with us. So, Kent, thank you very much for all Scott, of that. This, this is something to talk about. Normally, the Monday after Christmas, yeah. sales are, you know, really, really slow. This Monday, we had nearly as many orders as the Mondays leading up to Christmas. Uh, it didn't fall off. And we're still they were still getting hundreds and hundreds of orders yesterday were, were flowing in. So uh, yeah. that, that Christmas slowdown hadn't happened, but yeah, it hasn't happened yet, <laughs> but yet, but yet there's more work to do Amazon live and on and on and on, you know, yeah. it, it's about just trying to get better well, and get it done. We, we come on, we do these, these live programs because we want to actually interact with the, our community that supports, frankly supports us, or at least supports, uh, you know, uh, the, the industry of, uh, right. of uh, telescopes and microscopes and binoculars and all the different things that we do. But, um, uh, you know, we could just sit back and sell the box and uh, calculate how much profits that we're making or whatever. Um, and that is all part of running a business. But uh, I think it's a responsibility that we have to uh, interact with, with the community uh, if we can. And uh, doing these live programs allows us to do that. So 
We want to thank everybody for watching these programs and supporting them and sharing them, su subscribing to them as you do. And, um, uh, you know, uh, I know that uh, Kent gets that, um, uh, you know, the, this, this little bit of an extra uh, time that we, that we do spend, but uh, we, we feel that, um, that uh, you know, our community certainly deserves any support we can give them. So thank you again for watching and we'll see you tomorrow. So take care and keep looking up.